Secretary of Finance in Maharashtra, Secretary of Energy, Commissioner for Energy. Then when he moved to Delhi, he was Secretary for, I, I don't know the order in which he, he uh, served in these positions, but he was Secretary of Urban Development of um, Petroleum and Gas. And finally he was Home Secretary and uh, I remember visiting him when he was Home Secretary. That was one of the most difficult positions he held. And uh, then he voluntarily took retirement, which was again quite unusual for, the, for somebody in the civil service to leave his job at the top of his career. And then I used to wonder how he was going to um, create a new life for himself because he was coming back to Pune where he hadn't been for a long, long time. And then in the last many years, he has created a tremendously productive life for he himself and his wife is equally productive, by the way. She translates a lot of his books, uh, but also does translations and publications on her own. So in case of Madhav, he has apparently written 16 books uh, and several in Marathi. Additionally, he writes columns and most of all, he has remained a voice of reason uh, with tremendous amount of evidence-based research that he does uh, in publishing his books. So uh, that's uh, I. it's a pleasure for me to turn over this to Madhav and let's hear what he has to say about secularism. I know he has a lot to say. Thank you. So Madhav, stage is yours. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, this is a rare occasion <clears throat> after a long time to talk on this subject. I remember in, nine, in 2016, I was to give a memorial lecture on whether India is a secular nation. That uh, speech was called off at the last minute because what I wanted to say perhaps was not in keeping with what the government wanted, but the speech was widely reported nationally and a full copy of it was published in the Economic and Political Weekly. India's secularism has come into a lot of disrepute in the recent months and years. But it is, it is important to realize that the, on the background of partition, which was basically a two-nation theory, it was creditable on the part of uh, uh, Indian leadership at that time, headed by Gandhiji, Nehru, Patel, to opt for a secular India instead of making it a Hindu Rashtra, as was the demand at that time. And therefore, credit must be given to them that our constitution reflects important secular values, uh, which are rarely to be seen in most of the constitutions. It is interesting to see that the framers of the constitution had expected that secularism will bring the society together, divided society together, a multi-religious society together, and it will become a cementing bridge so far as India is concerned. Unfortunately, over a period of time, it has been quite the contrary. Not only Hindus, but even Muslims have lost respect for India's secularism. And therefore questions need to be asked as to why this is so. There is also a feeling that situation has deteriorated considerably after Modi came to power in 2014, so far as secularism is concerned. While partly this is true, but I should emphasize that India's position, when you look back objectively, India's position on secularism was always amorphous, ambiguous, and half-hearted. 
right from the days of Pandit Nehru. And I'm going to give evidence of this uh, uh, in, in my speech, which you will, uh, from which you can make out why I'm saying this. Firstly, it must be realized that when we talk about minorities in India, these are not racial minorities. These are minorities of people who were effectively Hindus for a long time and then got converted either to Islam or to Christianity. I would like to briefly uh, read for you what uh, a well-known Muslim intellectual, Dr. A. M. Kusro, who was an educationist and intellectual, he had pointed out that except for a few, two to three percent, who belong to the so-called descendants of Prophet and Imam Ali, about five percent who were the descendants of Mughals, and about seven percent who were descendants of Pathans. All the remaining 85 percent were Hindus. Hindus converted to Muslim, Muslim. And same is true of the Christians. After the 2002 Godra riots, about which I'm sure all of you have heard about, the Citizens Commission, which was headed by a Supreme Court judge, that commission had also commented to say that uh, majority of Muslims and Christians, so-called minorities in India, are basically former Hindus are converted into to these religions. And therefore, we must look at them, these minorities, somewhat differently than what you would look at minorities, for example, in Europe. This is a major distinction which must be borne in mind. Unfortunately, uh, fears which Jinnah had when he talked about two-nation theory, of the fears of majoritarianism are coming true in more sense than one, uh, particularly after 2014. But it was not as if everything was all right till then, though generally the impression is that the Congress government and the governments in the past, uh, before 2014, were highly secular as compared to the present government uh, in India. This is not true. I, I will uh, give a few instances of this. The first one most important is the separation of religion from politics. It is interesting to see that it was in 1948, even while the constitution was being drafted, that a resolution was moved by Ananta Shayanam Ayangar, who later on became the speaker of the Lok Sabha, and in which he had made a plea in that uh, resolution that there should be separation of religion from politics if India has to remain together. This was more or less unanimously approved uh, by the Constituent Assembly Legislative at that time, except for one solitary exception of a Muslim member. All others unanimously agreed. Even Nehru said, yes, I entirely agree, that steps need to be taken. And as soon as the constitution is uh, framed, we will take necessary legislative and actions to see that this is brought into effect. Unfortunately, when the constitution was framed, there was not a mention of this important requirement either in the fundamental rights or in the uh, directive principles of state policy. I'm unable to understand why the Constituent Assembly did not take notice of this. Thereafter, for 17 years that Nehru was in power, nothing was done on this score. This was followed by Indira Gandhi, who was again in power intermittently in two or three spells, for a period of 16 years, she too also did not take any action, though she had a two thirds majority, not only in the parliament, but also in more than 50% of the states. And you know, particularly during the period of Indira Gandhi, that uh, 19 
constitutional amendments were effected. Therefore, uh, she had a kind of a hang over the uh, uh, over the party in which she could have done absolutely anything, but she did not take any action to separate um, religion from politics. Then came perhaps the uh, largest majority in the of a single party of Congress, uh, which was during the days of Rajiv Gandhi, uh, following Indira Gandhi's assassination. He had a huge majority of 404 people in a house of uh, C-78-400. And in spite of that, he did not take any action. So why is it that Congress, which was which calls itself committed to secularism, did not take any actions at all during their very long tenure as prime ministers of this country. And, and as you know now, the problem is exceedingly difficult with a rightist party like a BJP in, in Sway at the center. And uh, therefore, the possibilities of such a separation of religion from politics is increasingly difficult, more or less impossible. This is, according to me, the basic reason why India is facing all the problems of, of secularism today, because we have not separated religion from politics. The second point, again, is something which uh, happened during the Congress regime. That was the um, demolition of Babri Masjid. One event which divided the country uh, completely along religious lines. Now, this again was done during the Congress regime, P.V. Narasimha Rao's regime. And uh, again, this was purely due to the inactivity of the central government headed by P.V. Narasimha Rao, not to dismiss the government of Uttar Pradesh as was recommended by the Home Ministry at that time, and uh, to continue to uh, talk to uh, members of the BJP and the RSS, hoping that uh, they will see reason and the, uh, the, the mosque can be saved, but did, this did not happen. Therefore, the two major events, in fact, I have argued in my book on, uh, uh, on um, Babri Masjid, that uh, the first car sevak was Rajiv Gandhi, because he was the one who opened the locks of the temple, which was there in the in the in the, in Babri Masjid, and therefore the whole chapter, whole agitation began after the reopening of uh, opening of locks of that uh, temple, and that was done during the Rajiv Gandhi's regime with his active blessings. Again, this. Uh, uh, his own followers have written and talked about why did he do it, do it? He did it apparently because he had passed an enactment uh, regarding Muslim Women's Divorce Act. Now, the, this was meant to overrule the order of the Supreme Court, which said that Muslim women divorcees will be entitled to all the relief which was available to any other woman under the uh, Criminal Procedure Code. And the fundamentalists among the Muslims were worried on this sco uh, score, agitated on this score, and uh, Rajiv Gandhi thought it is necessary to pass such a legislation. Therefore, according to one version, Rajiv Gandhi decided to open the locks on the on the Babri Masjid to please the Muslims because he had pleased the fundamentalist Muslims uh, by passing of that legislation. Therefore, this, this kind of a history which we have seen, um, India has had this problem of <clears throat> somewhat ambivalent position on secularism for a long, long time. For example, during the period of um, prior to 2014, before BJP came to power, uh, all window dressing was done to show that India was secular. Quite a important uh, positions 
constitutional positions were given to the Muslims. Representation of Muslims was substantial during that time. Uh, parties, uh, iftar parties used to be held with the Muslim cap being worn by everybody. Um, one after the other, steps were taken. Sharia courts, for example, were recognized during that period. In fact, India made an appeal to become a member of the Islamic uh, Union on the ground that we have such a large population of Muslims and India was rid of, rebuffed again and again. Therefore, this gave an impression as if India was a secular person, secular country. And in fact, this created an impression that this was a fake secularism, pseudo-secularism, and that gave a handle to the BJP and the RSS to start a campaign against uh, secularism. Therefore, uh, if we had taken action enough in the early years um, to take uh, to to strengthen secularism, I would I don't think we would not would not have been in this position today. Again, an important issue which needs to be borne in mind that rather than doing this kind of a window dressing that. I talked about to show your secular credentials. The major socio-economic issues pertaining to Muslims were not addressed at all. The uh, Justice Sachar Commission report, for example, a major initiative which was taken by Manmohan Singh government to appoint this commission. This commission's report is an eye-opener. That's that the development of Muslims is much lower, much more difficult, and much more neglected than even that of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in most of the areas. You will be surprised that this report, after it was submitted, could not even be taken for discussion in the parliament because there was opposition uh, from the Congress party and the others. Then came also an important uh, report of uh, Justice Misra Commission. Justice Misra Commission again, uh, comprised of uh, uh, Justice uh, Misra, who was um, uh, was a former judge of the Supreme Court, and two other members, one a Christian, one a Muslim, and a couple of others. They made major recommendations that the Muslims, there is as much um, caste system amongst the Muslims and the Christians as it is in Hindus. And this is all well known. And therefore they said to give special concessions only to scheduled castes, scheduled tribes on the basis of a religion is not right. The criteria must be economic criteria. It should not recognize anybody's religion, but the economic status of a person and give the reservations and the other uh, affirmative action facilities on that basis. Again, that report was not even taken for discussion in the parliament. This was all during the period of Manmohan Singh government. Therefore, the so-called secular government um, of the Congress party or UPA, United Front at that time, United Progressive Alliance at that time, uh, they gave an impression that they were secular, but the actions were quite the contrary. It is again interesting to see that uh, areas in which action could have been taken were deliberately kept aside. All this was entirely because of likely opposition within the Congress party itself and amongst the so-called secular parties. In fact, my main problem is that in India today, there is no real secular party left at all to whom one can look up to in terms of concrete action. I have been making a plea again and again, please give a commitment that if you come to power, you will take action on a few points which will make a difference to secularism in India. And hardly any political party is uh, prepared to do so. In fact, parties are vying with each other to visit temples, to show that they are pro-Hindus. Now, with this kind of 
uh, attitude, there is no likelihood of um, uh, secularism making a headway. Another complicating factor I should briefly refer to, and that is the position of the Supreme Court. In India, the Supreme Court perhaps is the most powerful organ, not just in India, but as compared to any other country, uh, the judiciary in India is the most powerful organ of the democracy. That uh, uh, court has done a great deal from time to time to uphold the rights of people. But on secularism, position of the Supreme Court again is ambivalent. For example, as early as 1964, Supreme Court itself said that the constitution does not draw a clear brick wall, does not erect a brick wall between the church and the state. And therefore it is difficult to say that India is a secular nation. This, is, this was 1990, 1964. Then came uh, several other judgments, which again raised doubts about India's secularism. For example, the judgment on the um, St. Xavier's Society, uh, in which Supreme Court again gave a decision to say that uh, uh, housing society can select its members on the basis of its own criteria and the secularism or uh, precepts of secularism cannot come in. Again, because uh, housing is an important element for bringing, bringing the people of various religions together. And this is something which is becoming difficult in India because of the Supreme Court decision that I talked about. Uh, again, a very important decision um, in 1995, 96, was pertaining to Hindutva, what is called Hindutva judgments, three judgments of the Supreme Court in cases arising out of the uh, uh, out of the election petitions, in which um, a member pertaining to uh, Shiv Sena was contesting an election in Mumbai against a uh, against a, another party member, and. All members of the BJP and Shiv Sena who came in to talk in terms uh, in favor of this member made an appeal to say that if you vote for him, the first Hindu state will come into being in India, in Maharashtra. Surprisingly, when this matter went in appeal to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court held that this was merely a wish list and this is not an appeal to the religion. Again, important enough, the Supreme Court pronounced that Hindutva and Hindu, Hinduism are all the same things and are a way of life and not a, anything rigid about uh, religion. In fact, I wonder if the Supreme Court at that time had read Savarkar's 1923 book on Hindutva. It is named Hindutva and in which in fact, that clearly showed that it, he was trying to make Hindutva into politicization of the religion. It was not on religion, it was politicization of the religion. Because he said, let us distinguish between those who are original residents or original um, uh, residents of India, that is Hindus, or those who are born here, whose, um, whose fathers, grandfathers lived here, and those who came from outside. And who are these outside? Muslims and Christians. <clears throat> Effectively, he said there are two nations. This was in 1923, much before Jinnah talked about a two-nation theory. And he said uh, there are two nations in India, a Hindu nation and a Muslim nation, except he made one distinction. He did not want a division of India at that time. He said, let them be together, but the Muslims will be second class citizens doing according, doing the biddings of what the Hindus would do, would want. Effectively, this was the beginning uh, of what Jinnah was worried about. 
in terms of Hindu majoritarianism. And the two nation theory, which is ascribed to Jinnah, was in fact the one which was started by Savarkar. The Supreme Court did not bother, obviously, to go into the this origin, this origin of the word Hindutva. And therefore, it said Hindu and Hindutva, Hinduism are all together, and it's only a way of life. But then, as one of the uh, prominent ideologues of the uh, of the RSS uh, Madhav, he has in his recent book on Hindutva has talked about to say rightly, according to me, that every religion is a way of life. Christians, Christian religion, for example, says how the Christians ought to behave or the Jew religion says how the Jews ought to behave. And therefore, nothing significant about India's religion, Hindutva being a way of life for Hindus. Therefore, if you, if you define religion on this basis, then uh, every religion is a way of life. But this decision of the Supreme Court uh, that Hindutva is a way of life and there is nothing wrong in uh, advocating Hindutva has now become a problem in terms of advocating secularism. Any, any political, particularly BJP and, the, uh, and its uh, other parties, including Shiv Sena, they say all that we are saying is uh, adopt uh, Encourage Hindutva, and therefore we are not uh, uh, we, we are not uh, talking against secularism. In fact, uh, as a result of this decision of the Supreme Court, no no one has been held responsible for making any communal speech. In fact, that is one problem. We in India we have made laws uh, to protect everything, but these laws are hardly ever implemented. How do you how do you take care of this? If uh, uh, you you have a constitution which uh, which uh, lays down clearly that uh, secularism is a is a part of the constitution, but it is not implemented. In fact, you will be surprised. This is a this is a clear situation which is not understood or which is not known to many people that there was a lot of opposition to even calling India's sec constitution secular because it was felt that secularism meant anti-religion and India cannot be an anti-religion uh, society. But uh, uh, later, it was only, only during the emergency period in 1976 when most of the opposition party leaders were in, the, in jail uh, a, an amendment was introduced to incorporate the word secular in the preamble of the constitution. Again, at that time, effort was made to define the word secular. And the Congress party itself said, no, we don't want to define it. Forgetting that their own law minister, Mr. Mr. Gokhale, H.R. Gokhale, during the emergency period, his one statement was very significant. He was opposing the basic structure doctrine enunciated by the Supreme Court uh, to protect the basic values of the Constitution. But the basic structure was not defined by the Constitution, by the Supreme Court. It said it will be, uh, it will be referred to from time to time depending on the situation. And that is how it should be. But Gokhale said anything which is not defined does not exist. And therefore, if you apply the same logic, you will have to say if in the constitution, if uh, uh, secularism is secular word is not defined, then we are not secular. But it will be ridiculous to say so. Because the Supreme Court has declared, I talked about some decisions of the problematic decisions of the Supreme Court. There are there is there is also a significant decision of the Supreme Court which said that secularism is a part of the basic structure of the constitution. That no political party, no parliament can make any change to uh, dilute the provisions of uh, uh, of the uh, of secularism. 
in fact this is something which which is holding us together that judgment of the supreme court by which even so even parliament cannot make any change in fact as i look back uh, we are really lucky in one sense that um, uh, an, an important amendment which was moved by the then janta government in 1940 uh, 1978 um, in the 44th amendment of the constitution uh, it had an important provision to say, again, uh, with the experience of the immediate past, that no major constitutional change can be made without a referendum uh, in which simple majority will decide whether that change should be made or not. And prima facie, it appeared it was a very good provision to have, uh, but the Congress party itself opposed it, fortunately. Because as I see it now, if that provision had been there and with the BJP government in power now, with a, with a referendum, we could have deleted the secularism part from our constitution altogether. So therefore, some things happened luckily for a country for uh, keeping it together. And uh, this is one of those, uh, uh, those events which, uh, which is important enough. Uh, therefore, the past is a very, um, very complicated uh, scene in terms of how secularism has developed. It is not an easy, uh, easy, easy precept to convert into a uh, into practice. But as I have argued again and again in several of my books, to say that having a provision in the constitution is one thing. But to operationalize it is quite different. What is now wanting is the operationalization of secularism. For example, Modi government now talks about um, uh, carrying everybody together, making no distinction between one citizen and the other. If that is so, which is a good thing, if you believe in that theory, then give the same affirmative action benefits to everybody and not just the Hindus or not just the Sikhs, or not just the Buddhists. Therefore, you cannot have it both ways. Unfortunately, the question of operationalization of secularism is something which no political party is prepared to address. Again, it's a very difficult uh, decision in a democracy. You have to rely on somebody to tell you some action is against secularism, or in keeping with secularism. In fact, I have been arguing that as in uh, Turkey, for example, you should have a secularism commission comprising uh, retired or uh, serving uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice as the chairman and uh, uh, judges of the Supreme Court or Chief Justices of the High Court and some uh, jurists and uh, well-known uh, national figures of integrity as members. And the, the, this commission should have an overriding uh, power to decide whether actions of anybody, not just the government, whether it is media, political parties, anybody in the government, in the country, whether their actions are in favor or according to uh, uh, secular precepts or uh, against secular precepts. But um, again, uh, uh, there, are, there is a strong opposition to having any mechanism, institutional mechanism to supervise the actions of the government and including the media, for example, including political parties. Because the, there is such a polarization in India today. We talk about or read about often polarization in the United States and other countries, but in, India is no exception. India's, India's polarization is as acute as that in the United States. Every issue is looked at either as a as a as, as a uh, issue uh, which uh, from the goggle of RSS and the BJP or uh, from the so-called liberal intellectuals. Nobody is prepared to see that there is a there is a middle ground which which uh, which can be explored for purposes of implementation of policies. And therefore, um, uh, 
secularism, Commission on Secularism is something which is overdue uh, again, uh, but unfortunately not palatable. I have been, I've been making a number of suggestions for strengthening secularism. One of the suggestions is that any place of worship demolished in, in communal violence must be repaired and made good by the government at its own expense. And let us uh, have a legislation for the purpose. In fact, if such a legislation was there, perhaps Babri could have been rebuilt because it was a clear case of uh, uh, law, law being taken in one's own, one's own hand and demolishing a place of worship. There are number of churches uh, which are demolished in or, uh, or destroyed or, uh, or brought into difficulties in places like Karnataka or Orissa. Now, um, if we call ourselves a secular nation, we must make sure that uh, uh, the state uh, concerned will take, uh, take the responsibility of repairs or rebuilding of these temples or places of worship. And this is, this is, a, this is a law which is long overdue. The other law which I have been uh, talking about is the need to make sure that uh, once a case is filed against anybody for communal speeches, for example, we go through this rigor of uh, uh, holding people responsible for making communal speeches. Not always, but at least in some cases. And then as soon as the uh, agitation is over, the government withdraws all those cases. Therefore, uh, the impact of that communal speech remains, but the man does not uh, get, uh, uh, is not held responsible at all. In fact, now we have a case in India, recent case, just last month, of a so-called um, Dharma Sansad. I don't know why it should be called a Dharma Sansad, because it is, it was advocating genocide of Muslims. But uh, Dharma Parishad, uh, uh, in Haridwar, uh, in spite of repeated efforts, cases were not launched against people who made those speeches. Even communal riots in Eastern Delhi uh, two years ago, speeches were made, highly communal speeches were made, and still those people have not been uh, uh, have, have not been prosecuted. There is a clear provision in the Indian Penal Code in. 153 uh, to take uh, action against such people. But you have, as I said earlier, we have enough laws in this country. In fact, this is one country in which every issue has been, uh, has been studied in depth. You have any number of reports, any number of commissions, but follow-up action is something which is, uh, which is totally wanting. Why is it so? And if that is so, in what kind of a democracy are we? The, uh, the major arm uh, to uphold the law, uh, the rule of law, is the police. Now, this is one area in which India is the weakest today. The police are so totally politicized, whichever government it is in, is in power, whether it is BJP government or the Congress government or the United Front government or the Socialist government or the DMK government, you have all policemen aligning totally with the government in power. You cannot have a rule of law in a country if you have this kind of a police setup. It was in 2006 that um, after a prolonged hearing of over 10 years in a public interest litigation, the Supreme Court finally gave a directive in terms of restructuring of the police departments, both in the center and in the states. And you will be surprised, this is the highest court in the land. Most of these important states, including the center, have still not implemented the directions of the Supreme Court. Can a, can a uh, democracy survive if the orders of the apex court are not to be implemented by the elected representatives of people? 
what kind of a democracy. In fact, we ought to redefine the precepts of democracy, looking at uh, working of democracy in countries like India. I'm talking about institutional, holding up institutions of democracy. It, uh, see, holding, upholding secularism is only one part of it. This is again an example of what can happen in a democracy if constitutional precepts are not upheld. You will have constitutional precepts. You can say, yes, we are a secular democracy. We are a secular country, but are we? Are the minorities feeling safe in India today? Are we giving them the kind of freedoms which were envisaged by the founding fathers uh, of the constitution? No, we have not. In fact, as you would uh, remember, uh, the, in the Constituent Assembly, the, uh, uh, the uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar had made a very important speech on minorities because provisions in the Constitution pertaining to minorities were strongly opposed by a section of rightists in the uh, Constituent Assembly. And at that time, he had said, the minorities can be very explosive if they are not treated properly as the experience in Europe and everywhere else has shown. And therefore we ought to be careful about how we treat the minorities. In fact, if India's security is to be taken care of as it is becoming important now with China on one side and Pakistan on the other, and both of them getting together, India being encircled by China. In that kind of a situation, to have a society at peace with itself is most important. But what have we seen? We saw that when Babri Masjid was demolished, the uh, terrorist actions after that, in terms of uh, a large number of uh, bomb blasts which took place in, in Mumbai, all of them were ascribed to uh, injustice against the Muslims. At one time, India was proud of the fact that Muslims in India were with the, in the mainstream of society and had not joined any of the uh, any of the terrorist groups outside India. Some uh, certainly went and joined I, I, ISIS, but. Uh, Generally, by and large, uh, the minorities in India have been peace-loving, have been caring for uh, society as a whole, treating themselves as a part of the society at large. Now, do we want to take any actions by which we will uh, alienate them? And this is my worry, that if you, uh, if you look at the larger picture in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, societal uh, peace and quiet, it is, it is necessary that we take all sections of society together in, in the development of this country and not, not just uh, uh, a section of them. And it is important to remember that today, uh, minorities account for 20% of India's population. And according to some projections, in the next 15, 20 years, their population is likely to be stabilized around 30 or 33% of India's population. Can a country develop or can a country go anywhere if it makes, uh, it treats 33% of its population as aliens, as second class citizens? No, not according to me or not according to, I'm sure, not according to any reasonable person. And therefore, the stakes involved are very large. It's not just a question of um, secularism in, uh, in theory or secular, secularism in terms of uh, precept, uh, constitutional precept, but in terms of running of the state, in terms of future of the country, this is something which will make a substantial difference to where we will stand in next few years time. And therefore, time has come when we give a very serious thought to um, where we are going to uh, lead 
uh, or minorities. If we are going to treat them as a part of the society, then a, a particular set of actions will have to be taken and otherwise another set of actions will have to be taken, which we seem to be taking now. For example, vigilantism, which is growing in number of areas in the country. Uh, it is, uh, I have not been able to understand why a central law cannot be passed against mass killings, against genocide, against lynchings, because something, this is something which gives such a bad name to India and to leave it to the states to say, because it is a state subject. The, unfortunately, we are now in a very peculiar situation again, uh, because of very strained center state relations, relations between the center uh, government of India and the states are so bad, particularly states ruled by the opposition parties, that uh, every issue is looked at as an issue of federalism. In fact, according to me, what matters is the well-being of the country at large and not that of the state or the center. And from that point of view, it is time we take a clear, um, a clear view in terms of our constitutional provisions themselves, but with a kind of a polarized thinking, which is working in, the, in India today, it is next to impossible. In my latest book on um, India, a federal union of states, because there is a lot of confusion on whether India is a federation or whether it is a un India is a union of states. And therefore, I have uh, written this book, it has just been released, in which I have made a series of recommendations to say that if larger interests of the country are to be taken care of, we will have to make sure that some of these basic problems which are uh, troubling us today will have to be dealt with apolitically. And that will call for a new statesmanship, a new maturity on the part of all political parties. And I would make a strong plea that that is the kind of a, uh, that is the kind of an India that we should all look forward to. There is a lot of misunderstanding about, um, about uh, India today, particularly uh, in the Western press. And I, every time I read it, I feel that it is uh, grossly exaggerated. Real issues are quite different. And any country facing these issues will be faced with the same kind of situations as we are faced with. But Western world looks at India quite differently than what they, they look at themselves. And therefore, uh, oftentimes I get worried that uh, uh, India is, uh, is being looked down upon in the, in the Western world. It is, it is not a gone case. In fact, it is one case of a very thriving democracy, as you can see from forthcoming elections or the elections which have just been over. But uh, these are all peripheral, uh, peripherals of democracy. What, what is important, according to me, is to strengthen the institutions of democracy. And that is where we are lacking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madhav, for such a thought-provoking presentation. Uh, if I may say so, this is quite similar to what's happening in the US. And many in the audience probably agree with that. But today's discussion is not about US, but about India. So I'm going to read the questions and comments that have come in the chat box. And I'll start from the beginning. Uh, Ajit Ranade says, Okay, this question is, when Mr. Gorbale says, <clears throat> nothing was done during 17 years of Nehru, 18 years of Indira, and six years of Rajiv, can he give an example or two of what specific legislations could parliament have passed to separate religion from politics? Madhav? Sure. I think what my statement was grossly misunderstood. <laughs> I'm not one of those who believes that nothing happened in this country till 2014 when the BJP came to power. No, I didn't say so, and I don't believe so. In fact, I have argued uh, extensively and very strongly 
in terms of what Nehru has done. In fact, my books on Nehru and Gandhi, Nehru and Indira Gandhi have brought out this very clearly. What I am worried about are the issues which were so crucial for India's democratic survival were not addressed. For example, the question of separation of religion from politics. This could have been done by making a constitution amendment and an amendment of the Representation of the People Act. Such an effort was made by, uh, by uh, P. V. Rao, Nasim Rao, after uh, Babri Masjid was demolished. This was in 1993, and such bills were introduced in parliament. Unfortunately, at that time, the Congress was so much on the defensive that it did not want, the, want to take opposition parties uh, on board uh, or consult them or to give them credit for carrying them along for passing such a legislation. And as a result, very short time was given to the select committees to deliberate on these very, very important issues. And finally, it came to a situation where uh, the bills had to be withdrawn, shockingly. Shockingly, a large number of intellectuals, jurists, writers, apart from political parties, were also opposed to the provisions of this bill. Quite frankly, I am not able to understand what, uh, what great refinements could have been made in that bill to serve the purpose. But only thing I would say is a uh, lot of um, peripherals could have been deleted and the bills could have been restricted just to the recognition of political party if in any way uh, its ideology is to bring in religion in politics. So, but this kind of a refinement could have been made in the select committee if enough time was given to them. But surprisingly, um, the then government did not want to uh, give enough time for the purpose or did not want to hold uh, enough uh, public discussion and debate on these matters. And therefore, uh, the bills had to be withdrawn. And like uh, in the case of uh, family planning, uh, uh, just as uh, excesses committed during the emergency, no political party was prepared to touch this subject all these years. Same thing is now happening to separation of religion from politics. And one knows quite well that there are political parties like BJP or BJP or SGPC or Shiv Sena or Muslim League, uh, they will certainly oppose it. But if all other parties get together, I'm sure it is not difficult to pass such a legislation, but there must be then a political will for the purpose, at least amongst the remaining political parties. This was a much more, much easier thing to do during the regime of Indira Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, and um, uh, and uh, uh, and her son Rajiv, because at that time they had two thirds majority in the parliament, both houses of parliament, and also fifty percent uh, of states will have to agree, and they had enough uh, uh, support from the states. This kind of a situation is not operating in India since the time the regime of uh, the, these three prime ministers was over. And that is my worry. That is a golden opportunity which we have lost. People may not like it. I'm a great believer. I'm, I'm a great, great admirer of, Indra, uh, of uh, Nehru. But I, where the fault is, you, we must recognize, we must, we must uh, understand that this is something which has gone wrong. Like Kashmir policy or like... Uh, China policies of policy of Nehru. Remaining things, I'm not uh, uh, criticizing him, but uh, where anything has gone wrong, uh, look, when we look back, we must uh, uh, accept that some things have gone wrong. Otherwise, there is no room for improvement. Okay. It looks like Ajit may want to comment on that, but let's finish all the questions in the chat box and then, then we can have open mic and have more freer discussion. Next comment is from Pratap Deshmukh. He says, excellent analysis of secularism. Hats off to Gurubele Sahib. <coughs> Next comment, a question is from Chandra Ranade. And he <coughs> asks, where do you think India is heading now 
in terms of social and economic inequality? And is the Indian constitution a problem in this regard? As, um, as I'm sure you know, the directive principles of the state policy specifically lay down that steps will be taken to reduce inequality in India. Unfortunately, like various other provisions of the constitution, this is something which has been totally overlooked and neglected by successive governments. And now the situation with the COVID, uh, um, <coughs> with the, with the COVID difficulty, the situation has gone from bad to worse. And currently, at least, I don't think uh, the government does not seem to be inclined to take any specific steps for the purpose, but the budget is due in another couple of days time. Let us hope for the best. Okay, next question is from Ajit Rangare, and he says, conventionally secularism is understood to be separation of church and state, or rather that people and parliament are supreme above king and pope. But some people say Indian secularism is not separation, but rather equal treatment of all, capitalized, all religions by the state. Do you think this is a useful and meaningful distinction? Well, um, you have brought me back to this uh, question of definition of secularism. Um, there has been a lot of debate in India over a period of time, including in the Constituent Assembly, on what kind of a secularism India is going to have. Um, in uh, 1948, when the uh, when Janta government came to power after emergency, um, effort was made to define secularism to mean uh, equal respect for all religions. Quite frankly, uh, this can be one definition of uh, secularism. Um, surprisingly, Congress party opposed this. And therefore, this, uh, this definition could not go through. Then there have been uh, several uh, definitions which have been suggested from time to time. One is equal distance of the state from all religions. This is something which is important for, in for India because uh, people uh, people say that a large number of steps which government of India has taken over the years are in relation to Hindu religion, but not as much in relation to other religions. And there's some truth in that. For example, uh, management of properties of churches. This was a demand made by a, a large cross section of uh, intellectuals in Kerala. Um, that there should be a legislation for this purpose. But again, due to a political fallback position, etc., cetera, the, uh, uh, no such legislation has been made. Therefore, all actions um, of the center must be equal distance of the state from all religions is something which is valid. But again, uh, it is very difficult for a political party to agree to that kind of a definition. Another definition, state should not identify with any religion. Again, there should be no controversy on the subject. But uh, do you think anybody in the government today is going to agree to this situation when today uh, Hindu religion has become the state religion? This is precisely what Nehru was worried about right from the first day, that this is something which uh, Hindu religion should not be treated as a state religion. And uh, therefore, such a def definition, again, is something which is difficult to agree. Equality before law, again, uh, uh, said um, more as a rhetoric in India than the reality. Uh, accommodation and tolerance uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, as a part of uh, secularism. And there are a number of definitions which have been suggested from time to time. It should not be difficult, but there is, I should also say that there is an important section of the jurists which have been saying this word should not be defined. That it is best that it is not defined. That it should be left to the judiciary to interpret it from time to time rather than give a constricted definition of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, secularism. 
I would suggest that let there be a public national debate on this subject and let this issue be decided once for all, whether we ought to have a definition of secularism or not. This is something which has been kept hanging for last 70 years. I think uh, one of the issues which, uh, we, which, is, which should be brought on the agenda of the parliament is this question of definition. Okay, Ramesh Deshpande has a couple of questions in the chat box, so I'm going to break down his message. His first question is, what is the future of secularism in India, which you have addressed in a part? No point in messing with the religion or relative loyalties. Can you address that? Can you please say it again? I didn't get the question. Okay, what is the future of secularism in India? No point in messing with the religions or relative loyalties. According to me, um, secularism's future in India is very bright. In fact, you must have seen the report of the Pew Group, PEW Group, which brought out uh, uh, religious inclinations, uh, religious inclinations of uh, Indians uh, just a few months ago, and in which they said, by and large, all uh, Indian population seems to be, uh, in terms of tolerating each other's religion, not encroaching on each other's religion, but permitting each one of them to uh, carry on with its own religion. And I think this is what finally it is going to be like. And it is this is what it should be like, rather than uh, encroaching on another's religion. And therefore, I believe that uh, even the uh, question of uh, common civil code, which is, which is talked about in the directive principles of state policy, which again is something which was uh, which uh, which uh, led to a lot of debate whether there should it should be a part of the fundamental rights or it should be a part of the directive principles and as a compromise it was decided that it should be a uh, it should be uh, mentioned in the directive principles. The Supreme Court itself several times made a plea that the government should bring up the um, uh, a common civil code for all religions. I also used to be, believe that this should happen uh, soon. But uh, thinking over the matter over, over the last few years, I think there is no need to hurry. There is no need to put everything in the straight jacket. Everybody does, everything does not have to be according to one particular uh, precepts or one particular law. Let every religion have its own, uh, unless human rights are involved like in the case of talaq or like in the case of divorce. Therefore, except in those cases where it relates to concerns, uh, human rights, all other cases, religious practices should be permitted to be continued as they are according to individual religions. There is no need to homogenize everything. Okay, Ramesh Deshpande continues to say, the only reasonable approach seems to be that the government should not, should run its business eliminating any religion-based criteria for extending benefits of any kind. The issue seems to have become unnecessarily complicated. What is Madhav's view on this? Has it become complicated? As I said, uh, question about uh, giving benefits of, of affirmative action to Muslims and Christians is something which is overdue. There is no reason why a backward class Muslim should not have the same advantages which a backward class Hindu will, will have or enjoys today. And therefore, a basic thinking in terms of that 1950 order, which confines scheduled castes and scheduled tribes only to Hindu religion. I'm not able to understand why at that, because at that time there was maybe when the constitution was framed, I'm guessing there, when the constitution was framed, there was a feeling that uh, Hindus who converted into uh, to Muslim or Christian religion went by their own volition. Uh, and those religions claim that there is no uh, 
there is no distinction caste distinction between them and therefore there is no need to give any such benefit to them and if such a benefit is given then in fact there will be more convergence maybe those were the worries which were there with the law makers at that time constitution makers at that time but i think things have changed um, conversion is something which has uh, which is which has become a bogey now in india with some political parties but conversions are not common conversions forcible conversions are more or less uh, ruled out in india today and therefore one need not have that kind of worry question main question is uh, addressing the issues of poverty inequality discrimination uh, which arises due to uh, caste system in uh, in these religions also and therefore it is high time we address these issues because as a society we have to we must carry everybody together and to bring them on the same level as everybody else and that purpose can be served only if uh, this this criteria can be revised okay i'm going to skip couple of comments uh, due to lack of time but going to take up some questions shobha dravid says if muslims were peace loving how do you explain the genocide of hindus in kashmir they were driven out of the state and became refugees in their own country well firstly um, i believe that uh, this uh, idea of rewriting history which is a common pursuit these days is something which is creating problems why hindus uh, hindu pandits had had to flee from jammu and kashmir there are two versions of it i also came across this when i was writing my book on secular on uh, on babri masjid the uh, one view which is propounded by uh, people like uh, justice sachar for example in his book he says that uh, hindus were persuaded to leave hindu pandits were persuaded to leave by the then governor jagmohan saying that you for for heaven sake you go out of state now and we will make uh, arrangements to bring you back the other view is that uh, pandits had to leave because of the atrocities which were being committed and there was no way in which they could have had any future in jammu and kashmir and therefore uh, in fact in, in in my book i have recommended that it is high time uh, farooq abdullah has also made such a statement uh, along with uh, justice sachar therefore i had said if uh, he he himself was a chief minister for a long time a judicial commission of inquiry could have been appointed as to why which were the factors responsible for the uh, pandits leaving jammu and kashmir and uh, what remedial remedial action now needs to be taken therefore this is an issue which is a very much a live issue um, i am glad that steps are being taken to bring them back to jammu and kashmir it is on their proper that uh, they go back to their own habitations and uh, uh, we should best is to forget religious animosities okay next question is from pratap deshmukh in recent past many states are established on language region is it weakened india by all parties sorry can i get, i didn't get yeah. in the recent past many states are established on language or region is it weakened india by all parties language issue is something which is uh, which is a very tricky issue in india uh, in fact in my latest book on federalism that i talked about um, i have devoted considerable time to discussing this subject there is a there there are two views on this question of whether every uh, whether every country should have a national language and there are others who believe that there is no need for such a national language so long as there is a common language of communication between the regions uh, in india the southern states and the northern states are a complete division on this issue 
In fact, uh, uh, with the with the globalization policies of, after 1991, uh, the severity of the language problem is getting reduced to some extent because large number of Hindi speaking areas are now taking to English and therefore uh, uh, earlier insistence on Hindi as a national language is being is getting reduced to that extent. But I have also made a plea that similarly, the southern states must take a larger view of matters and should not stop their younger generation from learning Hindi or any other languages, because this is the only way to proceed and uh, uh, to, not to make a politics out of it. But uh, this is something which is uh, which is a very, very sensitive issue and which will have to be addressed sensitively. Uh, last question is from Srikan Sathe. He says, why is there a Muslim law or HUF, H-U-F laws and not a uniform property law? It is said that civil servants propagated HUF laws for their own benefits. Well, there is a lot of controversy on this theme of what? That is the by which property was given by the Muslims uh, to the to the mosque, or uh, uh, and it was to be placed at their disposal for public purpose. There are also intellectuals amongst the Muslims themselves, including a member of the former member of the National Minorities Commission, who has strongly argued that this concept has become ancient time time bar and should is being discarded in number of uh, Muslim countries <laughs> and uh, therefore the concept of fakt itself uh, should be uh, abolished this is a very sensitive subject in terms of again managing the uh, ma managing the uh, thinking amongst the Muslims and uh, it will be largely a question of carrying with carrying them, uh, with any kind of a change that one would like to do. But at least in terms of management of properties, there is a great deal which can be done because there is a lot of mismanagement in terms of these properties uh, all over the country, which is well established. And therefore, uh, it is high time steps are taken for this purpose. But again, uh, by taking the Muslims along uh, with, with us in this process of bringing about the change. Okay, with that, we are ending our question answer session. If Madhav is okay, we can have open mic for a little while. So people sure. can pose a question and Madhav will be able to answer. Madhav, sure. how's your time? How's your stamina? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, so let's do this way. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question or a comment and then I'll identify you, open your mic and pose your question comment. Thank you. Right. Can I just make a comment? Sure, sure. Hi, this is Ajit Ranadi, and uh, thank you, Mr. Kodbale. A wonderful, enlightening talk. And I think from the comments also, you must have seen everybody appreciated a very balanced view you took. Uh, just, I'll take one or two minutes just to <laughs> clarify my qu first question to you was a reaction to your opening statement saying that. For a long period, there was enough majority in parliament for them to have done something specific to address this. Uh, so I was just wondering what that specific action could have been, which you explained in your answer. So thank you for that. And I look forward to our interaction in Pune in the near future. So we'll carry this discussion later. Sure. And uh, the, the specific thing that you suggested about RPA also, I think uh, Mr. Qureshi, former Chief election, election Commissioner, was in the session earlier. So those are actually, those are the kind of specific things uh, I wanted uh, to, but when we meet next, uh, we'll, we'll take this up. So thank you very much and I'm going to sign off now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Hello, Rajni, can I say something? Go ahead, Ramesh. Hello, Madhav. Nice seeing you after a long time. Yeah, nice to see you after a long time. <laughs> you look good. And uh, I'm, I'm amazed by your intellectual contributions to what? Thank you. India. I mean, that is amazing. I have been seeing Madhav since he was chairman of the State Illustrative Board in Mumbai. I don't know whether you remember. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Minister of Finance on World Bank projects. And now yeah. 
<laughs> so Madho has contributing, you know, to India's constitutional and uh, other reforms. That's so wonderful to see all this. Yeah. So I don't have a question, but my see what is what, what is perplexing. I mean, what is complicating this issue is just see what government can do. Don't talk about religions and what religion majority and all that. Simple, simple principle. The United States does. I mean, there are all religions in the United States. Everybody follows in there are mosques, there are temples, there are churches, there is everything. Everything goes on peacefully here. Only thing, government does not discriminate of any kind in religion in terms of giving benefits, facilities, whatever you call it, recruitment. Why not India pass such a simple resolution or simple, uh, simple decision that all government, now for example, the support to backward classes, you mentioned that, that uh, backward classes in uh, in these Muslims and uh, Christians are not taken care of, but backward classes in in India are receiving support for the last seventy five years almost. Gotcha. I mean, this is a, this is discriminated. So the first starting point is not bring religion and what you do in religion, do yourself. But government will not recognize the religion. Can this one thought be pursued more effectively? And what do you see the reaction will be on this? Thank you. Yeah. This is an excellent thought, um, which which will uh, make uh, several political parties uh, totally go wild. Yeah. <laughs> <But> their, very, <laughs> them... their very existence is going to be questioned. Yeah. But I entirely agree with you that the government, by and large, should remain away from religion. Exactly. But again, the problem has been that the constitution itself has laid a lot of stress on bringing about a lot of improvements in the Hindu in the, in the Hindu religion. As you know, Hindu code bill, for example, was a, uh, was, 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 a uh, was something which changed the, the field totally so far as Hindus were concerned. There were demands that similar reviews should have been done in respect of other, other religions, but the governments were not prepared to do so. And therefore, a lot of this reaction which has arisen is because of what has been done in the respect of Hindu religion, but not equally in the respect of other religions. The same point which you are talking about, that the government should either remain totally aloof or should be uh, equally involved in all religious activities. Exactly. Okay. That's, the, that's the thought too should be pursued and I think nothing more than that because yeah. uh, you, can, you cannot cope with these religious, <laughs> emotional and Religious yeah. aspect. Anyway, not, not not even in the United States. I mean, you can't talk about religions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next question is by Anu Abashe. Anu, go ahead. Yeah. Please. Uh, you know the the minute you talk about Muslims and the trouble for the problems they are facing, the pundit issue of Kashmir comes up again and again. And I've read up a lot. And I find there are such different versions about what happened with the pundits, how many died, absurd differences in the answers. Is there any book or any article you can suggest? Or can you give another talk about this issue, which is really I can't talk to anybody without this pundit issue coming up? Well, um... There are a couple of books which have been written by um, Hindu Pandits who have uh, left Kashmir and are settled uh, elsewhere in India today. But uh, authentic version of what happened to, uh, to Pandits is something which is not easy to come by. I, uh, I would request you to read um, the autobiography of um, Sheikh Abdullah, Char Minar, Char Chinar, in, in which he has, uh, uh, he has written quite a bit about pandits and how, what kind of a position they had in, in their life in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, but it all, there is a clear undertone of a uh, lot of anger against what the pandits did in Kashmir. This, it is important to know this because it comes from uh, Sheikh Abdullah, uh, Farooq Abdullah. And therefore, that is one way of, uh, there is one place 
in which you can get some idea of how pandits were looked at, uh, being looked at at that time. But there is no authentic uh, information, uh, not even any government report on this subject. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have. Do we have any more questions, comments? It's we are clo getting close to ninety minutes. If not, I want to thank everybody who attended this session. Special thanks to Madhav for really bringing back us, bringing us back to India to understand what it is all about. The U.S. based crowd, and thanks to Uma for introducing her brother, which was a lovely introduction. And we'll end the session with this Thank note. It was all great lecture. It's a great one. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Said past, I haven't heard so nice. Excellent Thank analysis. You. Thank you. Well, Madhu being in federal, quote unquote, central government for a long time, he has a unique perspective of what's happening in India. So we are so lucky to have him here. Because and I had been in Delhi for last 50 years. More than that. So mm -hmm. I have seen every situation and changes in the uh, situ situation, state formation and everything. So uh, it's an excellent analysis you did. Congratulations. Thank you. you. Thank you. Congrats. Okay, with that we'll end the session and we'll see you next Sunday where we are going to talk about a group of people are going to talk about their life after leaving Maharashtra for the green pastures as a newly married couple away from Maharashtra, non-Marathi region. So hopefully you'll join that session as well. Have a nice weekend and have a good week. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you, much. Mother. Thank you.